Um, it's been such an interesting discussion. And th there are so many of the themes that, that both Graham and Mark touched on that I think are relevant to, to what I want to briefly talk about, which is why we need to change our electoral system. Um, probably at the heart of them, really are the points that, that Graham was making about engagement, collaboration, cooperation, participation. Um, now, I don't obviously think if we change our electoral system alone, the UK will suddenly be a paradise where 99% of people vote in every election and every citizen will feel fully informed and read all the manifestos. Um, but there is a lot of evidence to show that in countries where they have proportional democracies, voter turnout is higher as much as 8% it can be. But there's also, as you're all, I think, I hope, believe, pro-Europeans, um, and, and you'll have seen how politics are done in many European countries, including, of course, in the institutions of the EU. You'll know that in most civilized parts of the world, people sit in a circle and have a discussion. And they even sit in a hemicycle. And it's true that the right is at one end and the left is at the other. And you know, you sort of make your way into the middle. So a Liberal Democrat is probably sitting just around the corner from uh, a Green and maybe sandwiched next to a Social Democrat. But you're not in this gladiatorial positioning that we have in Westminster, when you're basically the entire physical structure of our politics is designed to get you to disagree <laughs> with the other people. Now, why is that the case? Well, actually, it's because in real life, most of us don't disagree with most of what other people say. Now, I used to work for Jeremy Corbyn, obviously a very polarizing political figure, but I have uh, friends and relatives who've voted Tory. And if we sat down and actually had a civilized conversation, we would discover that we agree about huge numbers of policy issues. And certainly if I would have conversations with people on what you might broadly call the sort of pro-European, wing of politics, irrespective of the party they voted for, we clearly have a lot in common about our position on Brexit. If you were to put me in a room with Caroline Lucas, our one Green MP, I think there's very little that she and I would, would disagree about. We just happen to be in different political parties and we might have a slightly different sense of priorities. Now we know in European politics, that of course they have argy bargies and then I'm in Italy, you know, they argue ferociously, they wave their hands around, it always sounds very traumatic. But the electoral system encourages or indeed obliges people to work in a more collaborative way because they have to find consensus to build their coalition governments. And because they don't have these black and white election results that, that we have. Now, obviously I don't, I don't know where you all live and I, I don't know how, you all vote, but assuming some of you are at least in Liverpool, um, then many of you will be in five of the so-called safest seats in the whole of the UK. Now, what does that mean in practice? It means if you're in Liverpool, Walton, and you voted Labour, you did so along with 74.8% of the rest of the people of Liverpool, Walton. That seat is highly unlikely to ever change hands perhaps in the same way that Jacob Rees-Mogg's seat is highly unlikely to ever not be conservative. Now, if you're a Labour supporter, you might be quite happy about that. But if you're 25% of the population of Liverpool, Walton, which is still a lot of people, I mean, it could be one in four of us here this evening, it's a bit dispiriting to think that your perfectly legitimate views, I mean, unless you're a sort of fascist, but your perfectly legitimate views in wanting a conservative, or a Liberal Democrat, or a Green, are never going to be represented. And if you look at the way our electoral system works, it's actually as unfair for people in safe seats as it is uh, for other people. I mean, I myself, I was in Liverpool for many years. Didn't matter how I voted, I was always going to get Labour. I was then in South London. Didn't matter how I voted, I was going to get Labour. Um, some of you may have been in places where you always got a Labour person that you didn't want. Um, but the other side of this coin, of course, is that, you know, those of us in safe seats don't feel represented. Um, whilst the politics of the country are sort of driven by the priorities of a small number of voters in a small number of marginal seats. Because whilst you don't count in a safe seat, you count disproportionately in a marginal. And I mean, 
I would argue that we're seeing in the politics of my own party at the moment that there is a disproportionate chasing after voters in marginal seats who voted leave actually in the, in the referendum and the politics of an entire party are being driven by chasing after small numbers of voters. Now, again, that leaves many people feeling left out. What happens when people feel left out? They get frustrated. What happens when they get frustrated? Well, they either don't vote, which is bad for democracy, or I would argue they get angrier and angrier. They mount a single issue campaign and we end up leaving the European Union. And I firmly believe that one of the reasons we left, there are many reasons why we left uh, the EU, which I deeply uh, regret along with my friend and his brilliant banner in Hastings. Um, but one of them, I believe, is that in 2015, when the UK Independence Party should have come out with 15% of the seats in Parliament, now we might not have liked that, but if votes had been matching seats, they would have done, they didn't. On the back of having no representation, they were able to build this campaign which was really an anti-political campaign. It was an anti-political parties campaign. Of course, lots of other people supported them. There are lots of reasons why, why that campaign succeeded and the Remain campaign failed. But one of them, I believe, is the disenfranchisement for many, many, many years for people whose grievance at the beginning was possibly quite minor. Um, if you consistently ignore people, they're going to go somewhere. They're either going to become extreme or they're going to just not vote. And not voting, by the way, of course, always helps extremes. So that's the basic reason why I think that we should change the electoral system. And it's not to do with giving any particular party advantage. It's about just basic fairness and equity, which must be the foundations of any of any civilized society. And I mean, I was really I completely agree with everything that Mark said about the need to empower people and engage people more in community projects. I don't believe that any of that will ever really stick if we don't deal with the fundamental inequities which are at the very, very heart of our system, which basically mean that Caroline Lucas, who I think most of us, even if we would never vote Green, would agree is a very accomplished parliamentarian and is obviously now you know, the biggest representative in many ways of the biggest issue of the day. There's one Caroline Lucas in return for which I think you could get 16 Labour MPs. Now, it can't be right that over 800,000 people vote Green and they get one MP. Uh, not only does that leave them feeling unjust, it obviously, of course, has meant, I would argue, that over the years, Green issues have not been adequately represented in our politics. I think you could see this very clearly at the last election when the uh, Tory party wanted to make this all about getting Brexit done. Uh, the Labour Party wanted to make it all about talking about anything other than Brexit and they settled on the National Health Service. And we barely talked about the climate, despite the fact that whether you believe as Graham does, we should have a sort of uh, measured approach or whether you perhaps believe like me that absolutely it's crisis time and we must have radical action and very very quickly I mean wh whichever approach you want to take to dealing with the issue nobody in their right mind thinks that climate isn't a massive issue and yet it barely got a look in in the 2019 election and I think that is another feature of our electoral system. Um, finally um, there are lots of uh, lots of evidence that uh, in proportional democracies, some of the outcomes, even when you have uh, what you might call center or center right uh, governments are more broadly progressive than we manage in the UK. And that of course is because the Christian Democrats will find themselves in a coalition with the social Democrats. Uh, you know, even Silvio Berlusconi had to, you know, have coalition deals with other political parties. Um, it, it tempers the outer edges, but it has also meant that in most parts of mainland Europe, we haven't sold off all of our public, you know, public um, utilities. We haven't privatised the railways. There is significant evidence, um, particularly led by a man called Solomon Oriana, who's at University of Michigan, that countries with proportional democracies took action on climate quicker. And actually, if you look at the world's biggest polluters, none of them have got PR. Um, 
And if you look at the places where you've got Greens in government, it stands to reason, even if they're not the major party, that that agenda is having greater influence. Um, and so to Graham's point about us not wanting to now have a cliff edge in the way that we take action, I mean, I would argue that, you know, scientists have been saying for 30 years that we need to do something about climate. And had we had an electoral system which gave even just a little bit more weight to the Green Party, and we maybe had 10 Caroline Lucases and not one. And maybe if they'd been in the balance of power in some coalition governments, then maybe we would have taken action quicker. And the cliff edge would now be less of a risk. So I think the electoral system is really tightly, tightly bound into the whole of the discussion that we've had about climate. And I'd be very happy to tell you if you're interested about where the Labour Party is on this, because clearly, final, final point, we're not going to change the electoral system unless the Labour Party decides to back proportional representation, because the Conservatives are not going to change the system, which uh, for, for many reasons suits them well. Uh, whilst all of the other opposition parties, including the former UKIP party now reform back PR. So uh, the only hope of getting PR is that Labour changes its mind and then is either in a majority government and decides to do it, or perhaps more realistically um, is the largest party if a, in, a min, you know, in a minority government and the other parties basically say, give us electoral reform or we're not going to play with you. Um, I think that's possibly the most likely outcome for Labour anyway, if it's going to win, I think that's probably the best win it can hope for, and that is probably how we then get PR.